Hello, my friends of the Psychedelic Renaissance. It's Tom Hatzis, your psychedelic historian, and this is the complicated history of magic potions. Before we get started, if you haven't already, please subscribe to this Psychedelic Historian channel, and make sure you hit that little bell icon so that you're notified every time I post a new video. Also, it'd be so great to see you on Instagram. Please find me at Psychedelic Historian. And we do have a private Sanctum Psychedelia Facebook group where we talk about all things wild and weird. We'd love to have you join that conversation. With that out of the way, let's get into it. While bubbling potions of various colors might strike us today as some kind of Hollywood prop, in the ancient and medieval worlds, they were quite real. In those days, they were called love potions, or Pocola Amatoria in Latin, or Philtron in Greek. Adjusting for modern language, we would call them magic potions. These strange and mind-manifesting elixirs usually involved mixing some kind of psychoactive herb in wine, along with adding symbolic ingredients like animal parts, wash water, breast milk, menstrual blood, and even pubic hair. I don't mean to make it sound like all magic potions or love filters included some kind of psychoactive plant or fungus, but when you do read the records, it seems like that was the norm. Both Theophrastus and Dioscordus say that the highly psychoactive plant mandrake was the most common plant found in magic filters. In fact, according to Dioscordus, many people refer to mandrake as kirkium or Circe's herb, believing it to be one of the main hexing herbs of that goddess. We today remember Circe's potions as an elixir that turns a person into an animal. However, I don't think that was always the case. I think Circe's potions were the original love filters, and it was only later misogynist authors who rewrote them as these dastardly drinks. In my opinion, so far as concerns Western civilization, I believe this to be one of the earliest warnings against the ruining effects of overindulgence or substance abuse. Consider that the ancient Greeks and Romans did not have a word for addict. So, how do you describe that kind of behavior? Simple, you say that the person has reduced themselves to the state of a lowly beast. Let me say real quick, I'm not passing judgment here, especially against somebody who struggles with addiction. I've struggled with addiction in my life, so I know what that's like. So I'm not passing any kind of judgment. I'm just saying that this is how the ancients described this kind of condition. We have several sources from ancient scholars that demonstrate that they did not think people should be indulging in these kinds of magical potions at all. The first century of the common era philosopher Plutarch wrote how using these magic potions turned people into dim-witted, degenerate fools. And the second century scholar Apollodorus of Athens wrote how specifically the drugs found in these potions drove people crazy. Other warnings were far more dire. The 15th century Italian poet Angelo Poliziano wrote about a guy he knew who drank a love potion that was so strong and intoxicating that he fell over onto his sword and promptly killed himself. Oops. Nonetheless, people use them anyway for a variety of reasons. Sometimes the act involved nothing more than drinking or giving to drink one of these magical elixirs. The idea was to give the object of your desire some kind of stimulating or intoxicating drink and more or less getting them addicted to you via the drink itself. In other words, it was like a person saying, oh, you want some more of my mushroom wine or my opium filter? Well then first, I want dinner and a show. Other times, ingesting a love filter involved more elaborate rituals, as we see with the Sword of Dardanos rite found in the Greek magical papyri. Now, we don't know exactly when this particular spell originates, as the Greek magical papyri is a collection of magical rituals stemming back to the 2nd century before the Common Era and stretching all the way to the 5th century of the Common Era. In any event, this highly complex ritual fuses Grecian magic, Judaic magic, and the ingestion of a psychoactive plant. And here is how the operation worked. The magician had to find a magnetic stone, and on one side of the stone, scrawl an image of Eros burning Psyche, and on the other side of the stone, draw an image of Eros embracing Psyche. Then the magician was to put that magnetic stone into their mouth and recite a short spell. After that, 
the magician should inscribe a golden leaf with names from the Judaic tradition. Michael, Gabriel, and Oriel. Finally, the magician is to now drink the accompanying magic potion. This magic potion, along with several ingredients, includes over 3 grams of opium. I'm going to say that one more time. The magician is supposed to drink over three grabs of opium. That's a lot of opium. The magician has now transformed into the goddess or god or daemon worshipped by the object of their affections. Or, at least, that's what they have manifested in their minds. They did just drink a lot of opium. And so, notwithstanding the censorious remarks we heard earlier from Plutarch and Apollodorus, ancient lawmakers also did what they could to curb this kind of behavior. The earliest laws focused on intent. So take, for example, the ancient uh, high court in Greece that oversaw homicide cases known as the Areopagus. In one instance, they let this woman go after she accidentally killed her husband with a love potion. The judges believed that it had been an accident and she hadn't intended to do this. She loved her husband. So they said, yeah, shit happens, you know, <laughs> make safer love potions in the future. However, over time, this would change and soon outcome would supersede intent as the main determining factor in judging these kinds of cases. The second century Roman legal philosopher Quintilian would have a major influence on this change in legal perspective. He felt that even if a person had good intentions and gave someone a magic potion which led to insanity, illness, or death, they should be tried for that crime. Though, by the end of the third century of the Common Era, the Roman jurist Julius Paulus had determined that anyone caught using a magic potion, no matter their intention, no matter if anyone died or got sick or went crazy, none of that mattered. The supplier of that potion should still face criminal charges. Later on, Christian authorities would also address these pocolamatoria. Basil, now known as Saint Basil, even writes in one of his letters, If anyone has concocted some magic filter, and then causes death, I count this as intentional. Women frequently endeavor to draw men to love them by incantation, magic knots, and give them drugs which dull their intelligence. Wasn't that a great impersonation of Saint Basil? Oh, oh thank you, thank you, thank you. The 4th century Archbishop of Constantinople, John Chrysostom, blamed the fall of Eve and Adam in the Garden of Eden on a magic potion given to Eve by the devil. In that altered state of mind, Eve ate the forbidden fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In 829, the Council of Paris determined that the following acts, while maybe not necessarily illegal, were certainly sinful. Those things being astrology, dream analysis, divination, and the use of magical filters which they believed poisoned the minds of good Christians. A century later, the penitential of Egbert included punishments for women who engaged in things like witchcraft, enchantment, and using magical filters. The word used to describe these magic filters is the Anglo-Saxon Unleben, which specifically refers to a dangerous or harmful drug. Such potions were in strictly the domain of love magic, enchantment, and witchcraft. Sometimes they were used to initiate someone into a secret society. In one of those odd instances from history, this one stemming to 1028 of the Common Era, this guy named William decided to drink one of these initiatory potions at a most inopportune time. But first, a little backstory. That year, Count William of Aquitaine fell ill. And let me just say real quick that this is a different William than the one I just mentioned, because if you were a guy living in those days, well, chances were really good that you were going to end up being named either William or Johann. Anyway, Count William fell ill that year, and no one knew what was wrong with him, so naturally they just blamed a woman, because that's what you did in those days. If you didn't know what was happening when the shit hit the fan, you simply said, that woman over there is using witchcraft, and... That was it. That's all you had to do. Now, the woman, whose name is not actually mentioned in the records, because why would you do that? I mean, it's only her life that's on the line, right? Well, anyway, she wouldn't confess. So the courts decided that two men would duel to determine her guilt or innocence. 
a guy named Stephen fought in the name of Count William, and the other William fought in the name of the arrested woman. The two men met on an island in the Chachant River to engage in battle. Prepare for the fight scene. Now, for some reason, William had decided that earlier that day, he was going to join a secret society which initiated members by giving them some kind of psychoactive magical potion. We have no idea why William would drink that potion the day he was supposed to go fight somebody. Maybe he thought it would give him some kind of superpowers or instill in him more bravery and courage. We really don't know. What we do know was that it was a very bad idea because Stephen beat the shit out of him. Outside of William's ass kicking, and he actually ended up vomiting up the potion, the story actually does have a happy ending. You see, all of this had been going on behind the back of Count William, and when he heard about it, he freed the woman and granted her clemency. But this isn't the only story we have of people using magic potions to initiate others into their fold. The 1468 Treatise on Heresies by Ambrose de Vignati of Lodi contains a series of questions, one of which asks, Andare pocola amatoria sapiet aeresium which translates to whether or not giving love potions should constitute heresy. At the time, the mid-15th century, acts of witchcraft were starting to be fused with acts of heresy. And some theologians came to believe that, just like certain heretical groups would initiate members by giving them some kind of psychoactive Eucharist, that witches were doing the same thing. Other accounts stemming from Finnmark, Norway, seem to indicate that people were using ergot, the precursor for LSD, to teach people occult secrets. During the 1600s, the district governor of Finnmark, a guy named Hans Hansen Lillenskold, recorded a few cases where, as he put it, people learned witchcraft after drinking a beer that was mixed with little morsels that were black the size of barley grains. Well, my friends, that's all I have for you this time. And like always, I'd love to thank you for stopping by. Please like and share this video, subscribe to my YouTube page, find me on Instagram, and join our secret Sanctum Psychedelia group on Facebook, of course, if it all be your will. And please know that this isn't all I have to say about magic potions. I just wanted to give you the highlights. If you're interested in a deeper exploration of them, please check out my books, The Witch's Ointment and Psychedelic Mystery Traditions. And until next time, I'm Tom Hatzis, your psychedelic historian, reminding you that you free your mind by using your brain. Peace.